Thank you, Paige. I appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> As Paige mentioned, I'm going to be talking about sort of my personal experience commercializing some research that I developed uh, at Georgia Tech while doing my PhD. Um, I do want to preface this presentation by saying that, that the path that I'm going to lay out is just one of many options that are available to you if, if this is something you want to pursue. Um, so by no means consider this to be the definitive end-all roadmap. Um, you know, view this as sort of a, a one way to do it and, and take what you wish from this. So I'd like to talk a little bit at the beginning about the difference between software and advanced manufacturing. So when most people think startups, when most people think um, venture capital, um, Silicon Valley, all that sort of stuff, um, they're generally thinking about software technologies. Um, so usually there's a, a subscription model or software as a service model where um, you're connecting to some sort of cloud-based uh, program to either download or run uh, you know, a software uh, application that you're using for some uh, purpose or another. Um, you know, software is also somewhat characterized by, uh, you know, very low marginal scaling cost. So the, the amount of effort it takes to write your first, um, you know, batch of code to actually, you know, execute that application, you just copy that and you, you distribute that copy to everybody who, who uses your software. So the, the incremental cost of actually supporting um, you know, millions of users is relatively small. You know, it's mostly just on the back end when it comes to servers and, and, and marketing and things like that. Um, and, and the startup cost for these things, you know, you, you hear stories about, you know, some guy starting a you know, software company in his garage or, you know, just a you know, laptop working at a, on, a, um, on something at a coffee shop. Um, it, it's a very low barrier to entry. Um, and I, I want to sort of point out here the, the economic ac aspect side of things. You know, you, you have large multi-billion dollar companies like Facebook, Uber, and Salesforce. But you know, one of the things that I, I think is very important for us to realize as academics and you know, as people uh, in the innovation space is that software is about making things easier and manufacturing is about actually making things. Um, so you know, one of the things that I, I'm going to sort of Stay up front here. If if you're working on a technology that is software based, or you're working on you know something that is is scalable along the software pathway, this is probably not the talk for you. Um, I'm you know what what I'm going to talk about here is is about advanced manufacturing, and it's it's a lot harder than the software commercialization path because it has a lot of differences. So, you know, instead of being a subscription model, you're actually having to sell a product or you're having to license a technology to an end user. Um, it's also very incremental scaling. So, you know, it costs you a certain amount of money to make each component that you're selling or each you know, pound of material that you're selling. And you get economies of scale. But this means that you generally start with a very high initial cost. And it takes a lot of investment up front um, to, to get started in, in a manufacturing technology. Um, not only do you have to have a bunch of cash to do the R&D, you also have to have the right type of lab and industrial space. You're not, you're not gonna you know, develop a new type of, uh, of material or, or develop a new manufacturing process you know, working from a coffee shop. Um, but one of the things I, I, I think is it's worthwhile because if you look at the companies that are sort of the the, the, the giants of manufacturing, you have folks like DuPont making you know, materials around the world. You have forts like Ford and General Electric making products that actually have tangible impact on society today. So I, I, I would like to state that even though this is a, a much harder path to go down, I think that the, the benefits to society and, and the benefits to the world are in many ways more significant than software because we're actually making things happen and not just making things easier. So, you know, I, I put in the abstract for this, this presentation a uh, comment about the valley of death. Um, and, and what this means is it's a, it's a you know, fairly widely um, documented gap that occurs between academia and the private sector when it comes to funding new technologies. Um, so when you're when you're at the university, there's lots of federal grants and, and other sorts of funding sources that will help you do basic research and determine, you know, I can make 
you know, is this is this material conceptually possible to make? You know, is this process conceptually pos conceptually possible? Um, you know, you can do a lot of really early concept work. You can get sort of the proof of of of, of idea. Um, but the private sector, they don't really want to pay for that. You know, they're, they're, they're not looking for a process that makes a few grams of new material. They want to know how you're going to make tons or, or thousands of tons of this material. Um, and until you get to that point, they, they consider it to be too high risk for them to invest in. So you end up with this gap in the middle here where um, you're, you're trying to figure out how do you go from grams of material to tons of material. Um, and what you'll find is that there's not a whole lot of funding. Um, I'm going to talk through some some opportunities here and sort of our own path on this. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you it's it's a bit of a struggle. Um, you're going to have difficulty getting you know private investment. You're going to have difficulty. Um, you're you're going to be competing with a lot of other great technologies for grant funding. Um, and and you'll find that until you reach sort of a critical mass. It's really hard to get a strategic partner or a private investor um, that is large enough to help you really scale this to the final stages where it's commercially ready. Um, so as Paige mentioned, I did my PhD here at Georgia Tech. Um, I, I did my, my focus on my PhD was on composites and soft materials within the um, material science and engineering department. Um, we spun out this technology from Georgia Tech back in 2017 when I graduated. Um, the technology is, has benefited from a little over a million dollars of R&D and commercialization funding um, since it was invented in 2014. So this includes funds that came to the university for some of the early work, as well as funds that the company has raised on its own since, since becoming independent. Um, and and you know, we're, we were fortunate that we, we won a number of awards to help get us started. Um, so we, we participated in the, the Department of Energy's Clean Tech University Prize Program. Um, we've also been through the... Um, uh, well-respected plug-and-play accelerator program out in California um, and today we are we are headquartered here in Norcross Georgia just outside of, of the perimeter um, so maybe about 30 45 minutes from Georgia Tech depending on traffic and, and what our what our technology is and this is sort of you know just to show you what I mean by manufacturing technology is is we've developed a process that allows us to convert unidirectional thermoplastic tapes. So these are fiber reinforced plastic tape materials that are commercially sourced from you know, all the big names in, in the industry today. You know, folks like BASF and DuPont and Covestro and Dow, um, uh, you know, Sabic. Um, all, all of these, these tape products are currently made uh, and generally uh, processed through some sort of tape laying or lamination process. We approached this in a different way, and we looked at taking these tapes and converting them into a lattice structure. So that's what you see there in the green box. Um, and that lattice then goes into a secondary molded plastic part. Um, so this is how we get sort of our rebar for plastics concept. We have a, a continuous fiber reinforced lattice that is acting as a structural skeleton within a molded plastic part. And by combining this, this hybrid of materials and processes, we're able to produce a composite structure that is much cheaper than a conventional laminate um, while offering much better performance than a pure plastic molded component could on its own. So now that you have a little bit of background there, um, I, I want to sort of map out what this road looks like. Um, so this is a, a graphic that I, I pulled from uh, Nova Southeastern University, um, which is located in Florida. They have a wonderful little um, you know, flow chart here on their on their um, uh, tech transfer website. And I've added a couple of, of additional things to this. So th their flow chart basically shows what does the path look like from within the university. So the university you know, is, is focused on you know, doing the research, disclosing that there's an invention, you know, doing some evaluation, figuring out what the IP protection needs to be, figuring out how it's gonna be commercialized, um, and then there's sort of this split, and I'll talk to this split a little bit later, but you know, generally speaking, you can either choose to form a startup and license the, the IP from the university, or the university can go try to find uh, an existing corporate licensee. Um, but again, to my earlier Valley of Death comment, um, that tends to be a, a relatively difficult process unless this is like truly something that is either much more advanced than it should normally be for university level, or you know the this is a, a very high risk high reward uh, output 
Um, and then you know, the university basically, once it's it's gone from them, they don't. Really um, so the the little note that I added on the bottom here is sort of from the the technology side. What are you actually doing? Um, so in parallel with all of this IP and licensing and startup formation and commercialization, um, you still have to develop the technology. So the the research that happens in the lab is generally just going to demonstrate that the concept is sound and sound enough for the university to be able to file some IP around it. So once you've actually determined that it's commercially viable and that there is a path forward for this, you have to then go the next step. You have to do a proof of concept where you actually demonstrate that you can make whatever it is you think you're gonna be making. Um, and then sort of the hard part, you have to figure out how you're gonna scale that to something that is, is large enough to demonstrate that this is something that works not just on the wet bench or, or, or in a you know, very controlled lab setting, but that this works you know, at an industrial condition, an industrial scale that can be uh, comparable to what would be um, in production. And then sort of the final step is you take what you learn from the pilot scaling or the proof of, of scale project, and you figure out how to actually implement that into a production pro uh, process um, and that's really where it ties into that commercialization aspect at the end of their flow chart is, you know, once once you've actually started commercializing, you have to deliver. Um, and th all of this sort of works together, but it also means that, you know, these things are running in parallel and you have to pay for them in parallel. So you know, the very starting point of that flow chart is around intellectual property. And I want to give you guys a brief primer on intellectual property. Um, generally speaking, here in the United States, there's there's roughly four types. You have copyright, which protect with which protects some sort of written work. Um, generally speaking, this could be uh, computer code, this could be documentation. Um, you may you, you you're most common seeing copyright on things like films and books and things like that. Um, you have trade secrets. Uh, trade secrets are are a very broad category. Um, they have the benefit of of technically being uh, indefinite. You know, as long as you can keep it a secret. It's yours. Uh, there's no expiration date um, on on when uh, trade secret expires. Um, but you know, this is things like it could be a manufacturing process step that is not really discernible from the finished good. Uh, think you know Coca-Cola's uh, for secret formula. That's a trade secret. Um, it, this could also be something like your customer list. You know, you you may uh, it may be a secret to keep you know, a list of customers and how much they've paid for projects and things like that. That's you know it's important to the company to have that. You wouldn't want your competitors to have that. You keep that as a trade secret. Um, you also have trademarks. Uh, so trademarks are things like you know Coca-Cola's uh, font or the Coca-Cola bottle shape. Um, these are things that a customer uses to identify. Um, the, the product or to identify who they're buying the product from. Um, so th these are important brand based, uh, uh, you know, intellectual property, but generally they're not they're not protecting a tangible product. Um, they're they're protecting sort of the reputation and the brand and they're designed to avoid confusion and avoid counterfeiting and things like that. Um, and then at the bottom here you have patents. Um, so you know, one of the things that, it, you know, is very important to, 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 to state here is that Patents are a, uh, a public uh, disclosure, and in exchange for that public disclosure, the government gives you some sort of right to exclude. So this means, you know, you file a patent, that patent becomes public, you know, after the patent term is done, which is generally, you know, 20-ish years. Um, after that patent term is done, anyone can, can use that, that patent for whatever they want now. You no longer have protection. So you're trading basically a, a, a government protection for um, you know, the, 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 the confidentiality of this technology. So if you can keep it as a trade secret, in most cases, you're not going to file a patent on it. But in, in, in many circumstances, whatever it is that you're producing is not something that, that can be kept secret. So you file a patent on it to try to get as much protection as you can. Um, and the patents are really sort of the core of what the university does. Um, you know, because of the nature of the universities and public public publishing uh, research and things like that, it's it's relatively difficult to keep a trade secret that's been developed at the university level. Um, whereas patents are something where you know the university actually will file patents, they'll prosecute patents, they'll license patents, um, and that's really sort of the um, 
the, the currency of innovation at the university level. So for those of you who did not read your employment contracts uh, when you became a graduate student or a postdoc or a faculty member, um, there's a clause in that contract that says that Georgia Tech owns any intellectual property that you develop as part of your normal duties as an employee. And that would include all of the activities that you do at the university with respect to research. Um, because you know, as a grad student, that's what you're getting paid for. You're getting paid to do the research. Therefore, that is part of your normal job responsibility. So one thing that I, I, I talk to a lot of um, you know, uh, grad students about, I, I mentor in the Tiger program here at Georgia Tech. Um, and one of the things that I'm, I, I try to get across very early is that it's important for you to disclose your inventions to the university before you publish anything. And the reason for that is because the way that patents work here in the US and, and even more importantly, the way that patents work around the world, um, your patent protection goes away if you've publicly disclosed uh, whatever it is the invention is, uh, after a certain amount of time. So in the US, you, you have basically a year from the data disclosure. In other countries, you actually have no grace period. And as soon as you've disclosed it publicly, you've lost your ability to file a patent. Um, so, the, and, and this is kind of an innate trade-off within the university system. Um, and I, I've highlighted that here with this graphic um, from Nicole Morris. She's a Tiger director over at, at Emory University, who was kind enough to share with me some of her slides that she uses for these kinds of lectures. Um, and, and there's a trade-off where the university has an incentive to file as early as possible um, because it helps claim a broad field um, and potentially allows them to capture more license potential. Um, but it also has some disadvantages. You know, one of the things that, that we went through as, as a company is um, the first technology that we invented was actually not the first technology that we decided we wanted to bring to the market. Um, so the, it's important to basically not only disclose the invention when you think of it, but as the invention evolves at the university level, you need to keep the, the, um, the, the tech transfer office apprised of, of those evolutions to make sure that they can either amend uh, your, your application or file new applications that cover all the, the, um, the product concepts and, and process capabilities that you want so that the claims of the patent are actually valuable. Because um, the worst thing that you can have is you spend a bunch of money getting a patent and it turns out that what, what it is that you've, you've got the patent on is not what you're actually trying to commercialize. Um, and that sort of um, you know, uh, clash of, of ideas there uh, means that someone else can go ahead and do whatever it is that you're doing and you don't have any protection. Um, so industry is sort of the opposite and in many cases, the um, you know folks at private companies uh, will wait until right before they launch a product in order to file their patents. Um, so they, they potentially risk getting scooped uh, by somebody else, um, and they risk having some prior art cited before them if someone else files a you know something that's earlier. Um, but you, they're very good at sort of making sure that what goes into the market is exactly what's claimed. Um, so the the, the patents that, that are filed at, at, at these large companies tend to be very good uh, at, at sort of marking out what is the boundary of what the actual product uh, you know, protection is going to look like. So once you've made an invention disclosure, so this is, this is a form that you're gonna do on the, on the Tech Transfer website. Um, I think it's like Office of Industry Engagement uh, is sort of the, the larger umbrella um, that you can go search for, just you know, Georgia Tech Office of Industry Engagement. Um, there'll be a little button that says, you know, file an invention disclosure. Um, so once you've made a disclosure and you sort of told them, you know, this is what we think the, the invention is, this is, you know, all the prior art, all the things that we think are already in the literature, and this is how we think we're different, um, Georgia Tech will then go do a independent private art search or prior art search. Um, they will then present the results of that search to you and say, hey, can you review this? And, you know, if there's anything in here that you think, you know, doesn't really apply, give us a rebuttal. Um, so then you have to convince them, hey, you know, these patents are not really like what we're trying to claim because of X, Y, Z. Um, and if you've convinced the Georgia Tech uh, Tech Transfer Office that, that this is, you know, uh, something that is truly novel, not obvious in, in the prior art, um, they will then file a provisional uh, application. So the provisional application basically gives you, uh, it's, a, it's a cheap 12-month uh, placeholder, you can think of it. 
Um, at the end of the 12 months, they have to file a real patent for the non-provisional application. Um, but uh, within that 12 month period, you basically have time to sort of do more research, figure out exactly what the claims need to be in the in the non-provisional application. Um, and if, you know, if it turns out that that there's not really a lot of interest to go forward, the university is not out a lot of money because the provisional patents are relatively inexpensive. Um, but this does also start the clock on all the patent filing deadlines. Um, so as part of the provisional uh, patent application, you're going to be assigned an attorney to actually write the patent application. And this is sort of an important thing that I, I don't think a lot of researchers realize. Um, you need, as the researcher, you are the technical expert on your field, and you need to make sure that whoever has been assigned as your attorney seems to understand what you're talking about. Um, so you know, the little comic here on the left here, you know, to patent it, I'd have to understand it. You may need a different lawyer. Um, you know, if you're doing something in, you know, material synthesis, you don't really want an electrical engineer as your patent attorney. Or similarly, you know, you, you don't want a, bio, a biology major as a patent attorney on a mechanical invention. Um, and all these patent attorneys, they have a technical background. So you should ask them about their technical background. You should ask them about other patents that they've filed in this field, and you should become comfortable with them as you know, working with them on this patent application. And it's really sort of, it's a mutual relationship. You're gonna to need to revise and, and you know, provide critique to what they're drafting to make sure that they're actually converting your inventive idea into the right type of claims. Um, and if, you know, if, if, if they miss something, you need to correct that because once you've actually filed the patent, the non-provisional patent, you can't really change anything. Um, or, or not unless it's sort of a, a glaring, you know, um, non-descriptive error. Um, so the, the other thing to know about patents is they take a long time. So you can see here on the bottom, you know, from the date that you file that provisional application until the first office action is, which is when the actual, when the patent office actually reads and sends you a response about what the patent's gonna be, uh, like whether or not they think it's patentable, um, it can be anywhere between two and three years. And then even once they filed that response, you're looking at potentially another 12 to 48 months until it actually issues, because depending on how close your, your invention is to the existing prior art, you could get a lot of pushback from the patent office. And all this sort of adds up. So you know, the actual cost of getting a non-provisional patent issued in the United States is about $50,000 on the low end. Uh, you know, if you have to spend a lot of time arguing with the patent office, that of course goes up because you have attorney fees. Um, and then if you actually are pursuing a, a PCT patent, which is a, a patent that can be used in the global uh, patent system uh, where you basically file a PCT and then after a certain grace period, you then file patent applications in all the countries that you want to pursue. That's going to be, you know, two, three, maybe even four times the cost of this. Um, just because you have to trans, you pay for translation costs and pay for uh, attorneys to work on this in all the different countries. Um, so you know there, there's a lot of cost that goes into patents. Um, and one of the things that the university has to know uh, by the time they get to that non-provisional filing is, does this technology have enough potential to be worth the investment? Um, and you know part of the way that you can convince them is to demonstrate that you are going to spin this out as a as a startup or you can go and help help them find a um, existing company to license to. So I'm gonna pause here for a second on the IP side and, and quickly just pivot to, you're at the university, you need some help um, figuring out how to go about commercializing a technology, what are the resources available? Um, so Georgia Tech Venture Lab uh, is sort of the primary point of contact for um, all graduate student and faculty uh, inventions. Um, Venture Lab is basically designed, they have a, they have a sort of a two-fold mandate. Uh, one side of it is just general entrepreneurship education. So they run various um, programs to help train uh, graduate students and undergraduate students about how to you know, pursue entrepreneurship uh, within sort of a technical field. And then the other side of it, Venture Lab has a dedicated team um, that helps to spin out university technologies. Um, so within Venture Lab's portfolio, they will connect you to the Georgia Research Alliance, which is a public-private nonprofit here in Georgia that helps fund university uh, commercialization uh, and help you know, develop IP that comes out of the university and into a startup. 
Um, so we, we received uh, you know, Georgia Research Alliance funding, their phase one and their phase two program, uh, which combined is about $150,000 grant to the university to help get the technology ready to leave. Um, and then there's also a program called the National Science Foundation i program. Um, this is a uh, commercialization program that um, the NSF runs uh, to help train uh, graduate students and faculty specifically um, on how to do entrepreneurship. Um, so they, they're going to give you some grant money. They're going to ask you to go do a bunch of interviews um, to actually see if anybody cares about the technology that you're developing. Um, and then basically based on those interviews, they're going to have you, uh, you're going to learn what markets are the ones that are really going to want to pay for this tech. Um, there's also two other programs here, uh, Tiger. So Tiger is uh, technology innovation generating uh, economic results. This is a, a program jointly run by the Scheller Business School uh, here at Georgia Tech, as well as Emory University School of Law. Um, together, uh, this program is designed to connect PhD students, uh, business students, and law students into a one and a half to two year program um, that basically helps the PhD students go through the process of commercializing their technology and sort of, you know, it's a, it's a basically a, an academic uh, pathway for you to pursue commercialization and, and sort of build on all the other stuff that you're probably going to be doing in parallel with Venture Lab. Um, but, you know, do this as, as part of a team. You're not just on your own. And, and this also helps you network with a lot of the people who you'd want to partner with if you do end up forming a company. Um, Tiger is a uh, selective process, so you actually have to interview for it. Um, you, you can reach out, you go to look at the Tiger website, they'll tell you when the application process is. Um, it's changed a little bit in the few years since, since I've been through it, um, but it's, it's still a really good program. Um, and then the other, other one that Georgia, uh, Georgia Tech offers is CreateX. Um, this is oftentimes uh, the primary sort of entrepreneurship pathway for undergraduates, um, but I believe it's also uh, available to graduate students as well. Um, and this sort of helps you figure out how to incubate and set up a, uh, a company um, and spin the technology out of the university. Um, one of the things that I'll also sort of mention here just briefly, um, do make sure that you interface very closely with the Office of Industry Engagement uh, prior to setting up a company to commercialize university IP. Um, there's a lot of conflict of interest stuff that you need to have addressed uh, before that happens. Um, so you should definitely sit down with one of the, the conflict of interest uh, attorneys at the university and sort of map out what does that process need to look like uh, and when is it actually appropriate for you to make that company transition. Um, for us, we actually waited until after we were all graduated um, and, and out of the university completely before we set up the company just to make sure it was nice and clean. Um, but sort of the, the key point that I want you to draw from this slide is while you're still at the university and within sort of that um, support structure, you should try to de-risk the technology that you're developing as much as possible and also try to find your product market fit before you leave. Um, because you have all these resources available to you, this is definitely attainable. So for us, you know, we were able to build uh, prototype systems of our, of our equipment to demonstrate that it actually worked. Um, we were able to do i and figure out who our customers were. Um, we actually still maintain relationships with some of the people that we interviewed during i um, and And that's been sort of you know, a huge benefit for us going forward is that we are um, you know, very well connected and, and we've been in contact with some of these customers for over four years, even though we only formed the company towards you know, late 2017. So to my earlier comment, um, generally there's two ways to go. Um, you can either work with Georgia Tech to help them license this to a third party. So this would be you know, Go find a company that wants to buy your, your manufacturing process or the new material that you develop with your manufacturing process. Um, you basically, in that role, you act as support for the university. You help them make sure the patents are filed, make sure the patents are good, because um, the corporate attorneys on the other side of the table, they're going to critically review all these patent applications to make sure that they're actually um, providing the protection that the university says that they do. Um, you're also going to help with the tech transfer. So this generally means um, you're going to have to write up some sort of documentation or um, you know, supporting, uh, you know, working with the corporate engineers to figure out 
how do you actually train them and teach them how to do whatever it is that um, that you're, the university is licensing to them. Um, and then the benefit from this is uh, the, the way the university has set up their compensation structure for royalties. As an inventor, you get a percentage of all royalties paid to the university. Um, so you know it, it, it's perfectly reasonable as a as an academic at the university to invent lots of things, license them out to other companies, collect royalty checks, but stay at the university in an academic role indefinitely. Um, the other route, and the route that we actually took, was something called GTIPS or GTIPS. Um, this is a um, exclusive license package that Georgia Tech provides uh, only to uh, graduate students and faculty that are spinning out a technology from the university. Um, it's basically a, a pre-negotiated deal. You know, there, there, it, it has all the requirements for like when you have to pay back patent costs, what the license structure is going to look like, what the royalty payment structure is going to look like, um, what all the terms are you know, with respect to your obligation to the university. Um, the company, you know, the startup company that you're going to form is going to take on responsibility for paying all the past patent expenses that the university has already paid for. Plus, uh, you're going to be responsible for all the future patent filing expenses. Um, this is both good and bad. Yeah, you have to take on the cost, but it also means you have a lot of influence on what happens with the filing strategy. So if you, if you decide that you want to pursue patents in more than just the United States, you can, you can tell the university to do that, and you know, you're just going to take on the cost of that as part of your, um, your license agreement. Um, the university will generate revenue as royalties um, uh, on, on either the sale of your products or sub-licensing of your products. Um, as, a, as a company, um, you know, depending on what type of technology you're, you're producing, you're either going to be selling a material, selling a, a component, or licensing, you know, sub-licensing basically this technology to someone else. Um, in our particular case, we are manufacturing a material that we produce using our, our process and we sell that material. Um, and, and we, you know, there's also sort of the option within our, our, our uh, license as well that we, we can sell machines. Um, so we, we sort of have this sort of uh, two, two tier option there. Um, and, you know, the university gets their royalty payments from your sales. And then as part of the GTIPS agreement, uh, you know, in exchange for you getting some uh, preferred terms, um, the university is also going to take a, a percentage of your exit value. So if you're acquired, you IPO, you know, something, you know, you, you have some sort of uh, acquisition where, you know, you're no longer privately held or you're held by another company um, and you're paid a lump sum, then the, um, the university will, will have a, a, a share of that, of that activity. So I, I believe in our applications, and this is, I believe should still be standard, it's like 0.75%. Um, so the real question to ask yourself when you're thinking about this is, would you prefer to be in academia and be, you know, stay in academia for the indefinite future, or would you prefer to go down the path of entrepreneurship? So let's say you want to go down the path of entrepreneurship. I can go ahead and tell you this is very hard. Um, it's, it's in many cases, it's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of stress. Um, so that, you know, in addition to talking to the, the attorneys at the conflict of interest office before you actually set up the company, you also need to retain an attorney of your own. Um, generally speaking, it's going to cost you between five and ten thousand dollars to get a, a corporate startup attorney um, who can do sort of all of the company formation, the stock agreements, corporate contract templates, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, you also are I, I very strongly recommend that you find at least one other person to start the company with. Um, number one, solo companies are, you know, really hard for uh, investors to fund, you know, because it's sort of a key man risk problem. Um, and startups by their nature are very hard. And if you don't have someone else to sort of, you know, share responsibility and check your work, you're going to find yourself overwhelmed pretty quickly. Um, ideally, you want this other person to complement your weaknesses. So if you're you know, a lab person who doesn't like talking to people, find the business guy who likes talking to everybody and make them go out and talk. Um, you still probably need to go and sit in on the, on the conversations, but at least lets you sort of pause a little bit 
um, and have some time to organize your thoughts while they keep you know the customer distracted. Um, another thing that's you know important is titles in a startup don't matter. Nobody cares who's the VP of sales or the you know even CEO COO. Generally speaking, when your when your company is is a uh, you know quantity of two. Uh, you're in a position where everybody wears lots of hats and sometimes you switch hats because it makes sense that day. Um, the, the most important thing for you to do when you start up the company is figure out how you're going to do ownership shares between the partners. Um, and very strongly, I am opposed and I recommend that you, you avoid a 50-50 split because generally speaking, nothing is a 50-50 split. Um, you know, someone's always going to have to do more work at the beginning than, than towards later in the company. Um, and you should have some sort of structure that uh, helps to compensate the, um, the founders proportionately based on how they do their work, how much work that they do, how much value that work gives the company. Um, and this is all something that you should be discussing with your startup attorney when that happens. Um, and then sort of, you know, the, the last sort of item, the, probably the most important one is how do you find the money? Um, so you need money to set up your operations. You need money to actually continue the research. Um, and there's a number of sources here. So, you know, here in the state of Georgia, if you've gone through the Georgia Research Alliance phase one and two grants that go to the university, you are now eligible for what they call their Georgia uh, Research Alliance phase three venture debt program. Um, this basically gives you $250,000. Um, it's usually broken up into smaller uh, installments um, and you have to have some sort of matching funds or ability to demonstrate that your revenue generation Will allow you to pay back this um, this this debt funding, um, but the terms are very good. You have basically five years from the date of the of the of, um, of receipt of the funds to pay them back, and the interest rates are very low. Um, so you know this is this is a really good opportunity for you to leverage um, resources in the state of Georgia. If you plan to stay in the state of Georgia, that's another key one. You have to stay here um, for the duration of of your loan, um, and it complements a lot of other stuff. So. Um, you know, we, we've gone through this Georgia, the GRA phase three program. Um, I also mentioned at the beginning that we won the Clean Tech University Prize. We, we won the, uh, the regional competition that was held down at University of Central Florida. And um, we took third place at the national competitions that were held in Texas. Um, but there's a number of, of competitions both here in the Southeast as well as, as uh, nationally that can help you bring in some early startup capital. Um, you know, National Inventors Hall of Fame is another great one. If you if you're doing a patented technology, um, this is a huge opportunity for you. Um, and depending on the size and the number of these competitions that you participate in, you have an opportunity to win anywhere between five and a hundred thousand um, dollars. So this is pretty good seed capital for you to get a company off the ground, um, help pay for some of the you know payroll expenses and and facilities and things like that. Um, but generally speaking. In order to actually get from lab to market, you really have to try to secure a grant. Um, so these grants uh, come from a number of organizations. Um, sort of the, the 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 most common ones and the easiest ones to get into are uh, either SBIR, or STTR grants. So these are small business innovative research grants or um, uh, tech transfer research grants. Uh, this is is run by the the Small Business Administration. But the actual grants themselves are awarded individually by research agencies. So I've highlighted three research agencies that are particularly well suited to manufacturing and materials type technologies. So National Science Foundation has sort of a very broad program where you can apply for basically any technology to them. Um, and they will review that and, and provide grants. That's actually how we got our first uh, grant funding was from the NSF. Um, the Department of Energy has a, an entire group around advanced manufacturing. So um, that's another great opportunity. The only restriction there is that um, their priorities change every year. So you have, you have to basically look at the, um, the solicitation each year to see if there's actually a topic category that is relevant to your technology and then apply. Um, so you know, it's, it's not necessarily an evergreen type uh, grant source. You, you really have to hit it at the right time for you to be able to secure it. Um, then the Department of Defense also has some grant funding through SBIR. Um, they also have a, a large number of other um, grant programs that you can tap into. Um, the big thing to note here is the Department of Defense is very contract focused. 
that they are basically giving you a grant so that you develop a technology that they can then buy uh, down the line, whereas Department of Energy and NSF, they're not going to buy any of your product. Um, they're helping you develop this technology, and then they want you to then sell it to a private customer. Um, another resource that you can look at is Manufacturing USA. Um, this is the parent organization for a bunch of the international manufacturing or the, the national manufacturing institutes. Um, these are, you know, for us, this would be something like uh, the Institute for Advanced Composite Manufacturing Innovation, IACME, um, based in Tennessee, but with uh, satellite partners all over the U.S., um, these organizations are really focused on public-private partnerships. Um, as a startup, uh, you can partner with larger companies uh, and leverage uh, grants from the federal government as well um, in these joint uh, uh, technology development projects. Um, so it's a, it's a really good uh, opportunity to not only find grant funding, but also to find strategic partners who can help you bring this technology to market. So. Once you actually have some money in the bank, um, you have to look at how you're gonna scale the company. Um, so customers should always be your number one priority. Um, this is even more important for a manufacturing startup than for anything else because the difficulties of manufacturing startups and sort of the challenges associated with them uh, make investors somewhat skeptical about investing. They want, you, they, they want to see market traction, which means paying customers, uh, in order for them to determine that you are worth investing in. Um, so a couple of things to keep in mind when you're going after customers, warm introductions are a whole hell of a lot better than a cold call. Um, you should really try to tap into your network, both at the university and, you know, if you went through something like i tap into the i network that you met um, to find people who can help give you introductions because um, that'll dramatically increase the likelihood that someone's going to respond. Um, you also need to focus on finding an internal champion. So generally speaking, there's always going to be one person at the company who is more uh, enthusiastic about your technology than anyone else. And that person, you should meet with them regularly. You should ask for regular feedback. Um, be very honest with them about sort of, you know, what is the current state? Where is the technology going? Um, how do we fit in with their sort of innovation roadmap at the company? Um, and, and help them sort of sell you internally. Because um, you know, if, if you're just trying to sell to someone who's disinterested, not a lot's gonna happen, but if you can find uh, an interested person in the company who can influence other people, uh, it will make the process super, uh, you know, way, way easier than, than it would be any other way. Um, and then once you actually have a purchase order in hand and the customer's paid you to do something, you need to do whatever it takes to deliver. As a, as a startup and uh, you know, as a small company, uh, your reputation and your integrity is basically your most valuable asset. So if you, know, if, if you promise you're gonna have something done by a certain date or if you're gonna you know, do something for a certain cost, um, you should be willing to work overtime, you know, be willing to eat the cost if it costs you more than you thought it was gonna cost um, to make sure that you actually deliver the product when you said you're gonna deliver it in the state that it's supposed to be delivered. Because um, you know, if, if, you, if you make a mistake or you, you, uh, you know, basically make the customer look bad, or, or the, specifically if you make the internal champion look bad for betting on you, um, you're, you're gonna burn a, a very important bridge. Um, so the other thing I wanna point out here is fundraising is really hard. As I mentioned, you know, the number of, of investors who are willing to invest in manufacturing type technologies is very small especially at the early stage. Um, most of the investor uh, venture capital groups and things like that that do any sort of materials or manufacturing process technology, um, they've moved on to what's called Series A. So they're, they're gonna write a check that's $3 million or more. They're expecting you to have market traction either in the hundreds or even uh, low millions uh, of revenue per year, um, hundreds of thousands or low millions of revenue per year. Um, so the folks who are actually writing checks at seed stage or pre-seed stage, so these are things like $100,000 checks, half million dollar checks, um, these folks by and large are not savvy enough to feel comfortable leading your due diligence. Um, so you either have to figure out some way to collect a group of them and sort of, you know, convince them all individually to do, you know, to put in a small amount of money or um, you have to sort of find, you know, one person that you can convince, you know, wholeheartedly to write a big check 
and lead the round and then basically be able to bring all the other small checks in as well. Um, and because of this, you need to be willing and, and budget to, to spend probably fifteen to twenty thousand dollars just to go out and meet with these investors. So, you know, COVID's kind of a mixed blessing right now. Um, a lot, you know, nobody's doing in-person meetings, so it's a lot cheaper, but it is also a lot more difficult. Um, you know, there, there's all sorts of investment events where you can sit down and you can meet 10 or 20 investors in a single day. Um, and, and those have gotten a lot more difficult to do via remote platforms. Um, but you know, this is something as things start to return to normal, hopefully next year, um, you will want to make sure that that you have you know money in the bank when you start fundraising um, to be able to pay for you to go out to these events and, and do all this activity. Um, and unless or until you have consistent revenue coming in from the sale of your materials or from you know consulting projects with customers and things like that, you're going to be fundraising constantly. So you know just to give you a rough idea, we started our first real fundraising at the beginning of 2019, and I have not really stopped since then. I think I had a three month break uh, mid 2019 and then I started again. Um, so you're, you're gonna constantly have to fundraise and this means that you need to figure out how are you gonna balance fundraising activities with technical activities, with customer activities, with your limited resources. So it's a, it's a, a very sort of, there's a lot of tension there about your time and your money and figuring out how to balance that is, is really critical to your success. So I'm, I'm getting close to the end here. Um, I just want to cover, you know, real quick, incubators and accelerators. Um, so these are programs that help you either transition out of the university um, or help you scale the the the, um, the company. Um, so at Georgia Tech, we have ATDC. This is an incubator. Um, they're going to help, you know, they're going to give you some infrastructure so you, you can get lab space to actually do your research and continue the research in an area that's not part of university, you know, you know property, which is important for conflict of interest. Um, they're also going to help provide you some mentorship, some business model guidance, helping you figure out sort of how do you sell, uh, who should you be selling to, um, and you're going to be paying rent for these these incubator spaces. Um, generally speaking, this is is often discounted from what would be market rate rent in the same area, um, but you are going to be paying some sort of rent. Uh, with accelerator programs, they're a little different. They're not as focused on on incubating and giving you somewhere to work. They're really focused on how do we get you to scale and actually start generating revenue. And, and uh, you know, if you are already generating revenue, how do we get you to generate a lot more revenue? Um, so it, it's really focused on things like uh, customer and strategic partnership activities. Um, you know, some incubators that we've participated at or some accelerators that we've participated at are our Creative Destruction Lab. Um, we went through their program up in Toronto, but they've actually just opened a new program here in Atlanta. Um, and then there's the plug and play accelerator, which is uh, headquartered out in Sunnyvale, California, but actually has a multinational presence around the globe um, with lots of different uh, specialty trees. Um, so we, we, we specifically were targeting materials and mobility. Um, and these accelerators are, are also really good for giving you exposure through things like expo days or demo days that occur at the end of the, of the program to basically you know, show how far you've come in the last, you know, three to six months that you've been participating um, and allow you to get exposure to uh, investors who are going to be in your space. So the accelerator basically handpicks the investors that they invite to these events um, based on what their um, portfolio companies look like. And I should also note here that a, a good accelerator is not one that generally asks for equity up front. Um, some of them will offer, you know, we'll give you an investment in exchange for equity. Um, that can be a good deal depending on where you are in your development process. Um, but I would generally try to stay away from investors or from, from accelerators that are asking for equity just for you showing up. Because um, in many cases, these are going to be accelerators that are much more focused on software and everything in the software space is transactional based on equity. Whereas hard tech, uh, like, like manufacturing and materials technologies, um, you really need to conserve that equity because your valuations that you're going to get as you raise are going to be much lower uh, than what a, uh, an, an, you know, a software company is going to be able to pull. So to just give you a snapshot of where we are today, um, we will be announcing next month our first commercial product launch with uh, Old Castle Infrastructure. Um, I'll have more details uh, on a press release at that point. Um, that should be happening. The launch uh, itself should actually be happening later this year. Um, we're also collaborating with a number of OEMs, tier ones, and channel partners in the automotive ecosystem 
um, to evaluate our materials and technology for the interior and exterior space. Um, and as mentioned, you know, we're, we're constantly fundraising. We're, we're, we're raising our seed round right now, um, intending to raise our Series A in 2021. Um, so just to reiterate what I said at the beginning of the presentation here, you know, this is by no means the definitive roadmap. We're still a very early stage company. It's entirely likely that the pathway that we've taken has been either more difficult or not as, uh, as smart as it could have been. Um, so I, I just you know, I, I wanted to, to give this presentation to sort of share with you some of our learnings and some things that you should think about. Um, but at the end of the day, you're probably going to have to find your own road because um, there aren't a whole lot of manufacturing startups out there. Um, and each of them sort of has really their own pathway to get to the market. And with that, uh, I believe I would like to open it to questions. Paige, if, if, there, if there's no questions coming in, uh, I think we could just wrap up early if that works. Hey, yes. Uh, well, it was thank you so much for a very informative and practical presentation. I hope that uh, the attendees on the uh, webinar today are able to um, take some lessons learned from your journey. Um, I think you had a lot of very helpful information to share. So thank you very much. Um, actually, I just see a, a question came in. Uh, the question is, what led to your interest in material in the material manufacturing sector? Sure. Um, so this is something that sort of built out of my own experiences as an undergrad. So I mentioned I, I went to um, Auburn for my polymer and fiber engineering program. Um, you know, the I had always been interested in, in materials and, and material technologies. Um, I got a lot of interesting exposure in that program to both, uh, you know, high performance aerospace composites as well as uh, thermoplastic composite structures for ballistic applications. Um, and when I came to Georgia Tech, I, I sort of wanted to do something in the manufacturing space, um, you know, leveraging what I learned at, as an undergrad. And Ben Wang was my, my PhD advisor. Um, you know, and, and you know, I, I, we selected, I selected him largely because of his, his expertise in the manufacturing space. Um, so you know, just going through the process of, of seeing manufacturing technologies, the, the state of the art today, and then you know, being exposed to sort of the cutting edge of, of what is possible at the university level, it allows you to uh, sort of think of a new concept that uh, advances the state of the art a little further. So you know, that was really my focus was, you know, I, I had seen some of the limitations of conventional composite manufacturing, and I wanted to develop some way to address that. Um, and that's that's sort of how I got down on the path of my uh, my, uh, you know, PhD journey. Thank you. And Chris, we have several other questions have just come in. Uh, the next is, can you discuss a bit more about your first commercial product? Sure. Um, so this is a, this is a product that we, um, I've been developing with Old Castles for about a year now. Uh, we started working with them uh, in June of last year, uh, actually, uh, after meeting with their with their team at Plug and Play, so they, they were one of the strategic partners at Plug and Play when we went through that program. Um, and and this will be a new product that we're launching in, with them in the construction product space. Um, so we're providing a uh, a reinforcement solution um, for one of their new product lines, uh, and we're hoping to roll that out to other products within their portfolio as well in the next year or so. Okay, and a couple of other questions if you have a few minutes, Chris. Uh, the next is where should one start if they have developed something that is not patentable but was designed on Georgia Tech time? So if it was designed on Georgia Tech time, you should always sit down and do an invention disclosure to the university. Um, so you know, they will decide if it's patentable, basically. Um, you know, if, if you're fairly positive it's not, um, you know, if, if it's something that you know, is either software-based or um, you know, it's something that, that you might be able to treat as a trade secret, um, you can discuss those options with the university and figure out what are the uh, opportunities there. But you know, because you did develop it at Georgia Tech you know, as part of your regular work, um, it will be Georgia Tech property, and you'll probably have to figure out some way to license it out. Um, but when, it, you know, when, when, there, when there's no patents involved, it's a little bit easier because you don't have to worry about the patent expense costs and things like that. Terrific. And I see one other question came in. What are key ways to maintain as much equity at each stage of the company? Do you retain advisors, for example, and offer equity? 
So yes, um, it, it's it's important to sort of figure out what are you receiving uh, in in exchange. So so generally speaking, we have a we have a handful of advisors um, that we do provide equity compensation, um, but we don't we don't necessarily do it uh, the same amount of equity for everyone. You know, the 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 amount of equity is proportionate to that advisor's uh, interactions. I have one advisor who literally has a call with us every week um, to help figure out our sales pipeline. Um, and he gets a fairly significant amount of equity stake because he's basically doing a VP of sales job. Um, so you know, it, it's there's a lot of really good articles on the internet about what is considered reasonable equity for various types of roles. Um, you know, board members, you know, if you have an independent board member on your board of directors, that's a, usually a, an equity compensated position. If you have an advisor um, who's directly involved in either the, the technology or who's directly involved in sales or business development, um, you're usually going to have some sort of equity compensation. Um, if, if it's an informal uh, position, you know, someone who, you know, maybe is just mentoring you or things like that, generally speaking, those won't be equity compensated. Um, and I, I would also be hesitant to provide too much equity to people who are actually providing direct services. Um, so in, in many cases, if, if, if there is a way for you to pay for it in cash, um, it's generally better to just pay for it in cash. Um, but equity should be used sort of sparingly in, in cases where you're expecting this person to have a long term, uh, both long term involvement and long term impact on the company. Um, and you want to align their compensation structure so that if the company does really well, they will also have you know an upside from that as well. And again, this is this is something that uh, you know a good startup attorney should be able to give you some guidance on as well. Um, you know they, they they've seen a, they've done a lot of advisor deals, uh, you know advisor um, agreements, things like that, and and they should give you some some guidance on what they've seen in the past. Um, and what what looks reasonable to them. Thank you very much, Chris. So I think those are all the questions we've received thus far. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation today, and thank you to our attendees for taking time to log in and join us today. And uh, mark your calendar for next Monday at noon for our next Lunch and Learn series. Thank you again. Thank you, Paige. It's been, been a pleasure. Thank you all. Bye-bye.